Hello, everyone. My name is Bert Vox. I'm the fellow in linguistics here in the college. And I'm going to talk to you about my work with uh, Peter Monteith on Saltmarsh's magnum opus. John Saltmarsh was one of the quirkiest and best known figures in the history of King's College. From his arrival as an undergraduate in 1926 until his untimely death in 1974, he spent his entire career unwrapping the mysteries of our chapel, the last and arguably greatest achievement of medieval English architecture. But sadly, he was struck down shortly before he could bring his monumental study to completion. Today, I'd like to share some highlights of the seven-year saga of bringing Saltmarsh's magnum opus to the light of day, interwoven with vignettes from the lives of Saltmarsh and the chapel itself. Our story ends in November of 2015 with the appearance of Saltmarsh's King's College Chapel, a history and commentary edited by Peter Monteith and myself, just in time for the 500th anniversary of the completion of the fabric of the chapel in 1515. And in a sense, the story of the book begins with my parents buying this record here um, of the King's College Choir back in 1972 when Saltmarsh was within shouting distance of the retirement he hoped to use to put the finishing touches on his manuscript. I remember as a child growing up in Texas always being intrigued by the beauty and unusual proportions of the chapel overlooking a vast expanse of very non-Texan lawn in, on this album cover and aspiring to one day visit it and hear its choir in person. When I moved to Cambridge in 2006, I avidly read the lengthy section on King's and Willis and Clark's architectural history of Cambridge, the various histories of the college, and the other usual suspects. But there always seemed to be something missing. <clears throat> Even Saltmarsh's short introduction to the chapel left one wishing for a dedicated full-length treatment of the chapel's history. Then in April 2008, our librarian Peter Jones and archivist Patricia McGuire mentioned to me that we had in our archives an enormous part manuscript, part typescript history of the chapel by John Saltmarsh. I immediately asked to see it, and here's what they produced. I read through it and was stunned that such a magisterial study of the chapel could have remained unpublished for what was then 34 years. I then approached the college about publishing it, but being relatively new to Cambridge and King's at the time, I made my pitch to the wrong individuals. Um, <laughs> what seemed to me a solid piece of traditional, thoroughly researched scholarship was deemed outdated. Where were the discussions of memory, identity, performances of power, or gendered spaces? Um, today's historian doesn't want an exhaustive catalog of the Lincolnshire quarries from which the stone for our chapel was taken, um, or an enumeration of the canals um, <clears throat> by which the stone was ferried from um, the quarries to our frontage on the cam. He wants a narrative cast in the cultural concerns and analytical tropes of today. As a result, the idea was put on the back burner. But then in October 2013, two important developments put the Saltmarsh project back on track. First, Kings acquired a new provost, <clears throat> who unlike most of our provosts and fellows over the past 575 years, was not a Kingsman. <clears throat> and is not hampered by the reluctance that some kingsmen seem to feel to cherish their homegrown successes, <clears throat> be it the choir or performing one of Monty James's ghost stories in the provost's drawing room at Christmas time, which has been resurrected now. Second, in that same October, our assistant archivist, Peter Monteith, performed a recreation of Saltmarsh's legendary chapel tour in this very room revealing to me that there was a kindred spirit in the college <clears throat> who not only appreciated the significance of Saltmarsh's research on the chapel, 
but also had the archival know-how and energy necessary to get the project off the ground. Shortly thereafter, in February 2014, I proposed to Peter that we edit Saltmarsh's manuscript together, and he agreed. Thanks to a supportive set of college officers, particularly the provost Mike Proctor, the vice provost Rob Wallach, and bursar Keith Karn, we were able to procure the funding and permissions necessary to publish 500 copies of the book with Saltmarsh's old publisher, Gerald, in Norwich. I then hired two of my sharpest undergraduates, Rivka Hyland and Liz Kerr, to digitize Saltmarsh's typescript and notes in the summer of 2014. They needed every ounce of their wits for this project due to the complexity of the typescript and of Saltmarsh's handwritten notes. In fact, the project was so complex, especially once one made a commitment to verifying all of Saltmarsh's references and cross-references, tracking down the right archival images, procuring permissions, and so on, that the edition should have taken several years more um, or to complete. It's only thanks to the inhuman number of hours that Peter devoted to the project outside of his regular work day and some burning of midnight oil by Patricia as well that we managed to bring the book in on time. At this point, you may be wondering why a linguist who works on dialects of English and Armenian would be interested in a history of the construction of our chapel. <clears throat> on one level, you might say that Saltmarsh and I share certain interests. For example, we both enjoy discovering subtle historical details in the college, such as the survival of Wilkins's original high table chairs in what is now called the Saltmarsh Suite, and in my own set, F6. <clears throat> you can see here in Lecou's uh, original print here, the original high table chairs, and here is most of them in the salt marsh rooms today. <clears throat> <clears throat> or another example is what salt marsh writes about the relationship of the tower windows in the chapel to the staircases. I'm now quoting from his book. John Wastel, however, had a much stronger feeling about regularity of design. He seems to have been insistent that all the lancets in the west front must be of the same pattern. And rather than allow the pair below the leads to be different, he has preferred to omit them altogether. Therefore, in each of the two western towers, the revolution of the spiral at this level has no window at all and no light except that which filters scantily down by reflection from the revolution above. But if you are descending the stairs with three or four people behind you, no light filters down, and darkness is absolute. And just here, the builders have chosen to play you a practical joke. They have inserted a stair three times as wide as any of the others, in hope, no doubt, that you will trip over it. We've also both taken an interest in what periods of drought can reveal about the ancient layout of the college. If you examine this aerial image here of Kings and its surroundings, for example, you can see a number of relatively dead patches in the back lawn, which correspond to gardens, paths, and the location of our old bridge and bell tower um, that can be identified in old images. So, do you see this line here? That is where the path was that connected the old bridge that went basically through the center of um, the back area to the archway through the Gibbs building. And then can you see just above it, it's divided into three equal sections? Those correspond to three gardens that you can see in the old prints from the 16th and 17th centuries. And then you see there's a path going from the central path up to the um, southwest entrance of the chapel. You can see that in the old prints, as we'll see in a second. And I need a stick. Um, can you see a tiny square directly above my microphone? Um, 
it's readily visible most summers. It's um, maybe 10 feet square. That's where the old Campanile or bell tower was. And you can see it there if you look carefully. <laughs> Here is a detail from a map of Cambridge from 1575. And you see the three equal size gardens there. Um, and then just next to them where the old bridge was. And then the Campanile or bell tower just to the left of the path. <laughs> And in more detail, here is a Herodon uh, image of the college looking from the west from 1797. And here is the original bridge that survived until 1816. Another connection that Saltmarsh and I have is an interest in the dialects of East Anglia, especially Suffolk and Norfolk. As Wilkinson wrote about Saltmarsh, one of his favorite talks delivered over 13 years to 50 audiences, such as the King's College Research Students' Wives Group and various houses of the Fulborn Mental Hospital, was entitled Strange Happenings in the Countryside. The script consists almost entirely of stories and conversations spelt in dialect, with an occasional stage direction in pencil, such as Suffolk accent. <laughs> Saltmarsh had a rich network of personal contacts in East Anglia and a deep familiarity with the region, not only from his famous skates down the frozen cam, but also from frequent walks eastward to Newmarket, Moulton, and beyond to visit friends and family. He peppers his book with references to the traditional dialects he must have encountered during his meanderings. For example, when speaking of the origins of the workers recruited to construct the chapel, he says, if the building accounts give little indication of Mason's exact provenance, the researches of Mr. Harvey and Mr. Oswald are more helpful, as are also occasional entries in the subsidy assessment of 1513. Not ex unexpectedly, more Masons are known to have come from Suffolk than from any other county. Beneath the rising towers, ripe Suffolk accents must have been plentiful on site, and especially the singing lilt of Barry St. Edmunds. And referring to the busiest period uh, after the resumption of work on the chapel in 1508, he observes, likewise, what were probably the first consignments of Hampole stone amounting together to some 50 tons or more, were received in late July and early August. The flow of stone delivered under contract must have continued to culminate in the hectic 11 days between 4 and 14 September, when Weldon stone was pouring in by expensive road transport, <clears throat> sometimes at the rate of more than 40 loads a day in scores of miscellaneous vehicles. The resultant confusion around the chapel can be imagined. The front court and the back lawn thronged and busy with unloading wagons, with backing and turning teams, with carts and horses in constant tangles, and their drivers cursing and swearing in their own uncouth Midland dialect. Uh, another aspect of the dialect connection with me and Saltmarsh and Kings involves the Trudgill family. <clears throat> of um, Norfolk. Um, Peter Trudgill, uh, some of you may know, he's the, um, the greatest uh, British linguist of the past 50 to 60 years, and he was an undergraduate here in King's. Uh, he came from Norwich, and as you can see in the matriculation book uh, for the 60s, his dad, uh, John Trudgill, was a publisher's manager. And he was actually the manager for Gerald who were Saltmarsh's publisher for his original chapel book in the 60s, and the one we used for our book. Um, <clears throat> and Peter, too, uh, has taken an interest in the accents and dialects of um, Norfolk and Suffolk and so on. Um, and so that ties together my own work in dialectology with um, Saltmarsh's interest and with King's. And <clears throat> it appears that uh, John Trudgill um, 
was in fact in charge of the sales pitch for recruiting um, Salt Marsh and his chapel project to uh, Gerald. <clears throat> so these have just been some side stories. <clears throat> What about the heart of the book, the construction of the chapel and its contents? And what did Salt Marsh add to our understanding of the chapel through this uh, lifelong project? Uh, I can only give you one or two quick examples here. <clears throat> First, uh, in terms of dating the particular elements of the chapel, <clears throat> one of Salt, Marsh technique, Salt Marsh's techniques was to look at the high table dining records for the period from 1508 to 1515, when the chapel was uh, completed, and to deduce from that who exactly was um, involved in um, <clears throat> completing the roof, in completing the stonework, and so on. So <clears throat> he says that from high table records, we can infer who carried out the carvings on the organ screen and when. In eight places, the organ screen <clears throat> bears either the initials HA, looped together with tasseled cords surmounted by a crown, or one of the badges of the Bolin family. Clearly, Saltmarsh says, the screen was built between 1533, when Henry married Anne, and 1536, when he cut off her head. He then adds that these dates in turn lead us to our only documentary clue to the screen's authorship. On New Year's Day in 1535, while Anne Boleyn was queen, one Philip the Carver dined in Hull, as the college kitchen accounts record, with another foreigner. So that Philip must clearly have been a foreigner himself. Four days later, Philip the Carver dined again, this time with five other foreigners. All these foreigners dining in the college, one of them a carver, and very likely all the others, just at the period when the screen was carved, they must surely have been the foreigners who carved it. And Philip, whoever he was, sounds as if he was the chief carver of them all. Another striking aspect of Saltmarsh's work is his use of our primary archives uh, in the college. So the chapel building accounts, with, for which we have very detailed um, records of workers brought in and materials brought in in the period from 1509 to 1515, in this case, and the Mundum books and the um, high table records, as I mentioned, and so on. And <clears throat> I think you can imagine, even though you probably all did Latin and or Greek when you were students, which is not true anymore, but I think you can imagine even from your training, interpreting these early 16th century Latin documents is no simple task. And that's one of uh, Salt Marsh's greatest achievements, in my opinion, making sense of uh, the college records from this time period. From these records, he extracted a set of tables that chart the <coughs> ebb and flow of materials uh, into kings to build the chapel and of workers of different types, rope makers, um, plumbers for doing the uh, roof of the chapel, masons of different types, and so on. <coughs> uh, another uh, set of important um, <clears throat> new material that can be seen in Salt Marsh's book can be attributed to either directly or indirectly to the influence of Arthur Oswald, who was uh, um, an expert on the chapel and medieval architecture at the time. Um, <clears throat> and Salt Marsh appears to have been in fairly close contact with Oswald during this period. Here's an example from our archives of a letter from Salt Marsh to Oswald um, talking about the possibility of doing the project that we're uh, discussing today. <clears throat> so in terms of the influence of Oswald on uh, Salt Marsh, <clears throat> when speaking of the discovery of the original donation that enabled the last phase of work on the chapel fabric in the time of Henry VII, 
Saltmar states, no royal bounty flowed until in the spring of 1506, King Henry VII came to Cambridge with his mother, the Lady Margaret Beaufort, who thought of herself as heiress to all the godly intentions of her kinsman, King Henry VI, to carry to completion all his unfinished works of piety. On 22nd April, the Knights of the Garter held their St. George's Eve service in the chapel of King's College. It was then, according to tradition, that the king, at his mother's instance, gave his promise to see that the chapel fabric was finished. And weight has been added to the tradition by the discovery from the king's book of payments that in the week ending 1st of May, 1506, probably on the conclusion of his visit, he made his first contribution of 100 pounds towards the building of the church of the said college. And this is a record that um, Oswald seems to have uh, identified in the public records office. <clears throat> so uh, Saltmarsh covered, understandably, a constrained domain, the period of construction of the fabric up to 1515. That alone was a, a superhuman task, which he didn't quite manage to complete. But what about the developments in the chapel after that time that he chose not to cover in his project? <clears throat> um, some things I can't show you here, such as Isaac Newton's drawing of Halley's Comet flying over the King's Chapel in 1680, which I recommend uh, to you if you're so interested. Um, but uh, now I'd like to focus on some developments in the chapel in the, 19, in the 20th century before we uh, conclude. First, on the 1st of September, 1939, the day on which the Germans invaded Poland, a telegram was sent to the members of the College Council who in those days would still have been able to be on holiday in September. <clears throat> the telegram asked for their permission to remove the east window of the chapel to safety. That Michaelmas term, seven further windows were removed from the chapel. <clears throat> and by the end of 1941, all of the windows of the chapel, except for the west window, which is from 1879, so a very different vintage, had been removed and uh, spirited away to safety, and replaced with tar paper, which you can actually see in this image um, taken by someone for this visiting American soldier <clears throat> before the windows were put back in 1948. So this seems to be just after the end of the war, but before 1948. And on the left, you can see a document from the college archives detailing where exactly all of the chapel windows were uh, stored during the period of the war. <clears throat> the next flurry of activity in the chapel came 20 years later, <clears throat> spurred by Alfred Alnott's donation of Rubin's 1634 painting Adoration of the Magi, and perhaps some of the revolutionary architectural spirit sweeping through the college at the time, <clears throat> 1968. This led not only to the destruction of the drain and the faucet building and their replacement by that pinnacle of British design, the Keynes building, in which we currently sit, um, <clears throat> which do you all remember the drain? And then here is a view that, of um, Chetwin Court right before the Fawcett building was torn down. Yeah. <clears throat> so this period of architectural um, innovation and excitement led not only to the uh, tearing down of these buildings and the construction of the Keynes building, um, <clears throat> but also the removal of the high table in the east end of the hall and the creation of the college bar that you uh, pass through today. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
also targeted was the eastern end of the choir. The floor was taken up and the paneling and altar that you can see here were removed, ostensibly to allow room for the oversized Rubens to fit beneath the east window. <clears throat> An article in The Independent, which appeared when the renovated chapel reopened in December of 1968, deplored the gym crack light fittings and sniffed that the bricks of the Tudor brick arches that had been found underneath the sanctuary floor were allegedly carted off piecemeal by various fellows to make patios and the like. <laughs> Finally, in 1974, just as Saltmarsh was hurriedly assembling his notes detailing how a successor in the future might finish his book, the Rubens painting was damaged by vandals who scratched IRA in two foot high letters across the front of the painting. <clears throat> And thanks to an amazing feat of restoration, these enormous letters, um, which you can see here if you look carefully, do you, do you see the R here and the A, and then right up here is the I. This is a photo taken about a week ago. <clears throat> thanks to the restoration effort uh, commissioned by the college, these enormous letters are only visible if you stand at just the right angle within a few feet of the painting. <clears throat> so, December of 1974 left us with a new inscription on our Rubens painting and without John Saltmarsh, who, judging by the stories I've been hearing from alumni and family over the past year, was probably our most memorable fellow of the past 75 years. I'm looking forward to seeing what new tales of Saltmarsh's exploits, the appearance of his book, only 42 years late, brings out of the woodwork from all of you, if you're so inclined. I've intentionally left out of today's presentation the details of Saltmarsh's life and work and the incredible primary documents he used that feature in the outstanding exhibition that Peter has prepared for you in the archives. And I hope you will all make a point of um, making a visit to the exhibit before you head home today. That is all I have for you on Salt Marsh. And now Peter and I will jointly uh, answer any questions you might have. Thank you. <laughs>